So before um, we get into the presentation, um, I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge the country that we're all meeting on today. Um, so I, well, the land that we're meeting on today is stolen land and the beautiful catchment we've come here to learn about extends across Darwell, Yuin, Wadi Wadi and Gundungurra country. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend those respect, those respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people tonight. In what we do, Protect Our Water Alliance tries to stand in solidarity with all First Nations people fighting for justice, self-determination and sovereignty. I invite you to root what you learned from tonight's talk in this acknowledgement of country and deep respect for 60,000 years of custodianship of Aboriginal people. Please also let us know in the chat um, the country you're calling in from this evening. You can access the chat just by clicking on the speech button at the bottom of your screen. Um, yeah, and it'll be great to hear where you're all calling in from today. All right. So before I introduce our um, wonderful speaker tonight, Dr. Tanya Mason, um, I'll just give a little spiel about um, power and who we are and why we're doing this. Um, so yeah, welcome to Power Talks, the first of our series. Um, power, which is short for Protect Our Water Alliance for anyone who didn't know, um, is a grassroots organizing group formed in 2019 in response to ongoing mining beneath Sydney's water catchment in land of the Illawarra Escarpment. Since, the, since then, Power has been working hard to raise awareness about the mining that goes on and its damaging impact and mobilize people in our community to take action against various mine expansion proposals. We meet regularly on a fortnightly basis. So if you're interested in getting more involved, reach out and come along and we'll have some more contact details at the end um, and Rascal will be sharing some things in the chat as well for you to um, use to reach out. Cool, so as we get into our presentation, just some housekeeping. Um, we ask that you please remain on mute for the duration of the presentation to avoid any distracting background noise and um, respect our wonderful speaker. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, so hold on until then. Um, if you do have any technical or general questions through the duration of the presentation, please post them in the chat rather than interrupt um, the flow. And Rascal will be keeping an eye on the chat and will be able to help you out. Cool. So um, I will introduce Dr. Tanya Mason. Uh, so Tanya Mason is a research fellow at UNSW. She's a community plant ecologist with a particular interest in long-term vegetation dynamics, disturbance ecology and invasion ecology. Tanya has worked in upland swamp, coastal dune, dry sclerophyll woodland and inland semi-arid wetland vegetation communities and has kindly offered um, to give us a talk tonight on um, the impacts of um, the threats facing upland swamps in the Sydney basin. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass on the mic to Tanya. Thanks, Claire. Awesome. Um, Rachel's going to be in charge of uh, organising the, the movement through the talk. So thank you very much for that, because it seems that, um, yeah, it wasn't working my end. So we're, we're just running with it. But hello, everyone, and thanks for your interest in um, the beautiful upland swamps of the Sydney Basin. Um, I'll also begin by acknowledging the Darawal and the Darug people actually, who are the traditional custodians of the lands on which parts of this study were conducted because it was both on the Warrenora Plateau and also um, the Blue Mountains area that, that some of um, the upland swamp work that I've been doing has been conducted. Um, so tonight I'm presenting some findings from several studies that I've been undertaking um, at UNSW and they involve both glasshouse and field uh, studies. For this talk, I want to take you through the characteristics of the swamps, the threats they face and the research that I've been conducting to inform decision makers. So yeah, if we can move on to the next slide. Are you seeing the full screen slides just to check everybody? Yep. It's full screen for that one, yeah. Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, so the swamps are beautiful places, but they are certainly perilous. I've been bitten by ticks, and I've got a slide of that. 
I've donated quite a bit of blood to leeches. There should be a couple of, Rachel, if you can just click each of those. They're sort of, as I say, not animations, but just a sequential thing. Um, I've also sacrificed a surprising number of socks when I've been bumbling over the Lepidosperma limicola mounds, and that's a photo of that. Um, it's called sword grass for a reason, um, I certainly decided. Um, I've had to fight my way out of impenetrable thickets of Banksia um, ericifolia and, like, and Glycania dicarpa as well. Um, despite these hardships, the swamps themselves are stunning. And this is a photo of the Xanthorea resinosa um, in, in flower on, on Madden's Plains. Um, the Hakea teredifolia is forgiven its prickliness when it flowers in spring, and I've got a photo of that. And then when you walk from one swamp to the next, you're often gifted with these beautiful vistas of um, the Waratah flowers, for example. I've also been amazed by the tenacity of swamp species because even after relocation to the glass house, removal of above ground biomass and significant hydrological disturbance, many of them just get on with the job. So I've got a photo of Drosera binata, which is busily hunting insects. Oh, it's back, yep, that one. And um, I've also got Symphionema um, paludosum, which is flowering happily um, in the glass house. So it's just amazing how um, resilient they can be to, to disturbance, at least at times. So on to the next slide. Um, upland swamps occur under specific hydrological, topographic and geological conditions. They occupy the headwaters of streams and valley infill environments. In the aerial image up the top, you can see the dry eucalyptus woodland matrix, and I've got an arrow to that, and that surrounds the upland swamps. The Banksia thicket is on the upper um, and drier valley sides. There's a, an arrow to that. The restioid heath in the sedgeland, there should be two arrows. Yep, another one. And again, yep, they occur on the wetter valley sides. And then the cyproid heath and the tea tree thicket occupy the wettest valley sides and the floors in the landscape. Um, these upland swamp communities are groundwater dependent ecosystems and they rely on shallow aquifer groundwater um, in the sandstone bedrock to maintain the high soil moisture. So you can see in the cross section, um, the diagram below, that the conditions are wettest for the tea tree thicket and they're driest for the fringing eucalyptus woodland. So the next slide. So we've been working in these upland swamps, particularly in Darawal National Park for decades. David Keith, who's a professor at UNSW, has been surveying long-term monitoring transects at Darawal for over 30 years. Um, and those transects, I've just got a photo in that top left-hand corner of, of one of those, those transects that um, is periodically monitored. And in this research, we found that some communities are actually quite stable over time. And it's the wetter cyproid heath and tea tree thicket transects which are resistant uh, to change. But interestingly, um, the drier communities, so the restioid heath and the banksia thicket um, and the sedgeland, are often, um, often transition to different vegetation communities. At least that's what's been observed over that 30 year um, window of time that we've been monitoring uh, these communities. Banksia thicket does appear to have reversible change, um, but it is an important concept to understand that the drier communities are the ones that are perhaps less stable and um, less able to resist community change. Um, and it's that hydrological disturbance that may be hitting them the hardest paradoxically because they're the dry communities, you may not expect that. Um, uh, yeah, so just this idea of hydrological gradients and vegetation communities and variable resilience is, is sort of a theme that we're investigating. So if we move on to the next slide, um, swamps themselves, of course, provide very valuable ecosystem services for human populations and for other populations for that matter. Um, and this graphic comes from the Ramsar Global Wetland Outlook Report from 2018. Um, 
swamps provide a number of different services, regulating services, services um, on the right hand side. Uh, these are services such as water purification, flow rate regulation, flood mitigation, waste decomposition and carbon sequestration. Then we've got provisioning services in the centre there, and these include raw materials, genetic resources, and of course, water supply. The swamps are strategically positioned in the catchment area for Sydney's water supply, and they act as large scale sponges. They collect and they store water and they release it slowly over time. On the left-hand side, we have cultural services and they include um, the significance of the, the swamps for um, Indigenous culture, recreational opportunities, tourism and, and ecotourism. And the swamps provide supporting services to primary production, nutrient recycling and global water and carbon cycles. The, um, the swamps and the peat soils can be very important um, in carbon storage. And so that's some an element of particular interest um, specifically in relation to, to climate change. Um, wetland function and upland swamps, of course, are a, are a type of wetland, are disproportionate to their physical area. Wetlands cover less than 3% of the land surface, but they contribute up to 40% of global annual renewable ecosystem services, with provision of high water quality considered their most important service. So on to the next slide. Coastal upland swamps are listed as endangered under state and Commonwealth legislation and a number of threatening processes affect them. Perhaps one of the least tractable and the most pressing of these threats is alteration of hydrology following subsidence due to long mining. Upland swamps overlie significant metallurgical coal deposits which are used in steel making. And in the figure up the top, you can see the long wall mining footprint with the um, overlaying swamps. Um, we can see long wall nine and 10 shown here, and they were extracted um, between 2013 and 2015. As we know, uh, long wall mining is ongoing in the catchment area. Um, the underground long wall mining involves extracting rectangular blocks of the coal seam. A shearer extracts coal along the long wall face, and I have a photo of the process on the left hand side. You can see the hydraulic lift supporting the extraction tunnel as a shearer moves across the coal face. But as the long wall progresses, the tunnel is allowed to cave into the void beyond it. And then in this graphic on the right hand side, you can see that when mining disturbance occurs, it causes collapse, fracture, and disturbance zones. And the subsidence can be expressed on the surface. Um, here you can see the fracturing on the right hand side at the top of a sandstone outcrop at the surface above a long wall. The disturbance can profoundly alter the hydrological parameters of the swamp system um, at the surface. Move on to slide seven. So there are multiple tiers of governance in place to redress ongoing declines in swamp extent and condition. And this occurs directly via conservation management and indirectly by influencing land use decisions through legislative and policy frameworks. Australian governments have agreed to implement ecologically sustainable development or ESD. And these principles in essence aim to provide for the needs of the present generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The mitigation hierarchy for managing environmental impacts is an important policy tool to achieve ESD. And Australia has ad um, adopted the principles of ESD and legislation by requiring developers to first avoid impacts. And that's what I've sort of got with this reverse uh, triangle and then sequentially to minimise, restore, and finally offset or compensate any unavoidable impacts. The mitigation hierarchy has been adopted as a principle in legislation. In New, in New South Wales, um, ecologically sustainable development is well embedded in legislation and it's used as standard terminology in over 60 statutes. The next slide. Okay, um, so 
if you can just click through numerous government and industry reports, that's what I'm just showing here. There's another one and a third one, I think, have indicated that long wall, oh, yeah, have indicated that long wall mining is um, affecting swamp hydrology. But the evidence has been largely confined to the grey literature, and that's what I'm trying to show with these various reports. It's predominantly anecdotal and it's qualitative. So we wanted to get a quantitative understanding of what the mining disturbance means for swamp hydrology and long-term resistance and resilience to change. We looked at soil mo moisture retention in the Vado zone, and the Vado zone is just a fancy word for the soil zone between the surface and the groundwater zone. We compared soil moisture in unmined and mined swamps, and we were interested in how water storage and regulation functions of upland swamps may be affected by longwall mining. So we wanted to cut through some of the grey literature, which is not like has, a, you know, incredible value, but perhaps is is not. Um, it needs to be on the scientific record. Um, these these findings essentially is where I'm going with that. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, the study sites were located in eight upland swamps on the Warrenora Plateau for this, um, for this study. Um, and the sites were located above Longwalls mined in the catchment area by the Dendrobium mine. These are the ones that are the black squares in the, in the map, in the figure. Um, one of the sites you may see uh, just below the three black squares is a black um, triangle and it was um, above the mine footprint but at the time that the study was conducted it was not undermined so we um, considered that to be an unmined swamp community. Um, four further sites were located to the north and the south of the mine footprint in Darawal National Park and on catchment land. Um, the sites were representative of the hydrological gradient and they included dry banksia thickets and wet tea tree, cyproid heath and um, rescued heath and so on, all of the different um, sub, sub communities within the upland swamp complex. Uh, on to the next slide. At each site we established automatic hydrological monitoring stations, each with three dielectric soil moisture probes connected to a data logger to measure moisture by percent volume in the soil profile. The probes contained four sensors at 10, 20, 30 and 40 centimetre depth. Daily rainfall was measured using a tipping bucket rain gauge and you can kind of see that in the photo in the background there. And we controlled for a number um, of environmental co-variables to try to address the fact that the mine sites were clustered. Um, we calculated soil moisture persistence as the number of days after each rainfall event until soil moisture dropped below 50% and we used accelerated failure time models for the analysis. I won't try to go into the stats but hopefully the figures will kind of tell the story I'm hoping. So next slide please. Um, this figure shows those persistence curves that I was mentioning. That, that's um, the unbroken line um, for each of, the, uh, each of the figures there, and it includes a standard error. So we're, we're sort of including um, some of the error in, in each of the models. Um, and this is for the 50% soil moisture threshold. The mined swamps are shown in mustard and the unmined swamps are shown in blue. Um, and we have results for the tea tree thicket, cyproid heath, restioid heath, sedgeland and banksia thicket. The data themselves were collected from um, 2012 to 2017. So it's a, it's a you know, considerable amount of time. We're not talking in, in weeks or months, we're talking years worth of data. Um, by testing for differences between vegetation types, the unmined and mined sites and an interaction of those two factors, we were able to show a number of results. Firstly, we found very strong evidence for differences in soil moisture persistence between the mined and the unmined upland swamps. And this was after controlling for vegetation type and other environmental variables. So soils at the mined sites were drier than soils at the unmined sites. And I'm hoping you can see that it's particularly evident for the tea tree thicket and the cyproid heath. You see really good separation of the blue and the mustard. 
less so for the restioid heath and the banksia thicket, but the um, statistics are still coming out as um, difference, differences between mined and unmined sites, regardless of which vegetation type we're talking about. Move on to the next slide. So we were able to show that there is more than an order of magnitude decline in wetter communities in the mine swamps and a factor of four to five in the drier communities. Um, the modelling also tells us there's strong evidence of hydrological differentiation um, across the vegetation communities in the unmined swamps, but this hydrological differentiation, that, that way of being able to have the drier and the wetter communities in close vicinity, that's destroyed by the mining process. That hydrological gradient is destroyed by the mining process. So we're just not seeing that differentiation um, within a small area that we usually see in upland swamps uh, when, when mining is present um, below the, the, the swamps. We've also found that uh, soil moisture continued to decline with time since mining. So we're not seeing a stabilization or a resumption of the soil moisture levels. And by that, I mean that the swamps are continuing to dry over time. And I just wanted to demonstrate to you the sponge sort of capacity of the swamp soil. Rachel, I don't know if it's gonna work, but you should, yeah, you should be able to just press on that and hopefully, yep, we can get that going. This short video shows me lightly pressing a swamp turf that we have been using in a related glasshouse experiment. And it's this water regulation and retention function that we stand to lose permanently when long wall mining proceeds. So you can just see how much of a sponge those, those soils are just with that small little um, sod that I've got there. We move on to the next slide. Okay, for a subset of swamps, we were also able to obtain piezometer data contemporaneously and piezometers um, measure groundwater levels. So not just the soil moisture in the soil um, in that vado zone um, close to the surface, but further down into the groundwater level. So here I have a qualitative comparison of rainfall, soil moisture and groundwater level um, signatures in unmined and mined swamps. On the x-axis, that's the um, horizontal axis, we have time. So those are the years that we were monitoring. Um, and on the y-axis, the vertical axis, we have the hydrological signatures in the groundwater, the vados and the surface zones. And you can see that while the rainfall pattern is similar, if you just click on that, Rachel, you can see what I'm talking about. Just one click should show us, yeah. So you can see the rainfall pattern is similar across both of the swamps, um, but the soil moisture and the groundwater level responses are very different. So in the unmined swamps, we see persistence of soil moisture and groundwater levels for prolonged periods. If you just give that a click, yep, you can see that there's that prolonged high um, soil moisture and groundwater levels that, that are evident in the unmined swamp. And then if you click again, I just want to highlight that in the mined swamp, it's a different story. We see a transition to rainfall responsiveness. So we see spikes in moisture when the rain falls, but a rapid return to low soil moisture. And those shallow aquifers that are so important to the groundwater dependent swamps become unavailable to mined swamps. So they're unable to have those prolonged periods of high soil moisture and groundwater levels. On to the next slide. Mining, fire is certainly a recurring and an endogenous or expected disturbance in upland swamp systems. Fire is a top-down force that consumes biomass and then it stimulates germination and flowering in many swamp species. And you can see the strong regeneration after fire in those lower photos that I've got there. But alteration of fire regimes, either through fire promotion or suppression, is certainly a recognised threat to upland swamps. The fire component that I'll be concentrating on for this presentation is the effect of the interacting hydrological stress coupled with a single fire disturbance. So I won't be looking at frequent fire um, necessarily. I'll just be looking at fire as a way to transform upland swamps 
once they've been affected by um, underground mining. So on to the next slide. Here I have a conceptual model of how mining and fire disturbance can interact. So initially we have a natural swamp, if you can give that a click, just to show where we are in the model. When it's dewatered following undermining, another click, um, the hydrological response may take weeks to years to be expressed in their vegetation. Because, the pro because um, possession is nine tenths of the law, the extant swamp individuals may continue their representation despite a change in hydrological resources. So we may see this time lag occurring. At this point, however, the swamp is actually transitioning as we can see in the yellow with that yellow box there. Um, but there is this ecological lag in vegetation expression. Then a fire disturbance occurs. Yep. Um, and this top down force removes the above ground biomass and it essentially resets the landscape and it opens up niches for a range of species adapted to the new hydrological regime. A shift to a transformed swamp community may then occur. That's the red box. The community may transform to a novel terrestrial rather than a groundwater dependent ecosystem. So this is how we're conceptualizing the process, how swamps may actually change from being swamps to being terrestrial uh, communities. And this conceptual model is certainly backed up with field observations. The photos that I've got on the right hand side show two swamps burnt by the same fire in the 2019-2020 fire season. The swamps pictured are actually on the Nunes Plateau, but the, um, the concept applies to the Warrenora Plateau as well. The top photo shows a mined swamp 16 months after the fire, and the bottom photo shows an unmined swamp 11 months after the fire. So even with those five extra months of regeneration potential, the mined swamp has substantially less recruitment than the unmined swamp. So our questions for this leg of the research journey were, what is the effect of hydrological and fire disturbance on plant biomass, species richness and composition? And is there evidence of ecological lags or synergistic effects associated with hydrological and fire disturbance? And I'll go through each of these. So on to the next slide. To address the research questions, we collected sods from intact swamp soil during March um, 2017. We sampled cyproid heath and tea tree thicket because these are the wetter sites which we thought would be most affected um, in, in terms of losing the um, hydrological um, drivers. And we collected their sods at four locations, Mount Hay and Kings Tableland in the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney and Madden's Plains and Cataract Dam on the Warrenora Plateau, south of Sydney. All of the sample sites are at swamps that are unaffected currently by underground mining. We hammered a PVC sleeve, which was 150 millimetres in diameter and 250 millimetres uh, deep into the soil profile. And you can see um, the process in that top right hand uh, photo. We then extracted the sod with a shovel. The uh, sods were clipped to about 10% of their original biomass. They were bagged and transferred to the glasshouse. The sods were randomly allocated to three levels of water availability. And these were low um, in the center photo. You can see very little water in the bottom of that Nelly bin. There was um, high, oh, sorry, the low conditions corresponded to um, an, a mined site. High corresponded to conditions in unmined sites. Um, and that's in the center uh, section of the photo and medium which were intermediate. And that's on the right hand side of that center photo. You can see um, the experimental setup. And we achieved these water availabilities by, by maintaining water levels within the Nally bins in the glass house. Um, sorry, just back to that previous slide. We then applied a fire treatment to half of the sods in November, 2018. And this involved clipping the above ground biomass and applying heat and smoked water to simulate a fire event. We measured biomass species richness and soil moisture at interval between April um, 2017 and November 2020. So now to the results, if I may. Um, 
So in the next few slides, I'll be providing, I'll be presenting the graphical results of the statistical model. Again, I'll try not to go into the stats too much. Um, so first up, we found that there was a clear differentiation of that treatment effect of having very little water in the bottom of the Nally bin as opposed to medium and high water availability. And hopefully you can see that in this um, figure. So in both the burnt and unburnt sods, uh, the high water availability had higher soil moisture than um, the lower water availability. Another interesting finding there was that the burnt sods had higher um, soil moisture than the unburnt sods. So when you sort of look from unburnt to burnt in the red, you can see that it's slightly higher in the burnt as it is for both medium and high water availability. And the and this does make sense because transpiration rates should be lower in the burnt sods because we removed above ground biomass. So the plants aren't transpiring as much. They're not pumping as much water up and out of the soil. And that's perhaps why they're retaining um, the soil moisture. Um, and we did sort of postulate that that might actually reduce the effect of undermining. If you undermine and then you have a fire, maybe you'll hold on to the soil moisture a little bit better but we'll see that over time that doesn't actually play out. As you would expect, plants continue to grow and then as they grow, they transpire more and then the effects become more apparent. But it may explain um, some of the lag effects that we're seeing. Um, so next up, can we look at the next slide? Yeah, um, I wanna discuss the fire treatment effect. Um, and this is just a video, it's, it's um, playing there of the fire that we simulated with a propane burner on each of the sods. Um, and we did this 18 months into the experiment. So it shows the heating procedure. We recorded the soil temperatures by inserting temperature data loggers, and that's shown with the um, green circle up there in the right hand side. And these are little eye buttons. We inserted them at two levels in the soil profile. And if we look at the maximum temperatures that were reached, we can see that the soil is heated to a greater extent closer to the surface, which makes sense. And we can also see that the low water availability sods experienced higher temperatures than either the medium or the high water availability sods. And the salient point here is that soil moisture has an insulative effect. Um, so if the soil is really dry, then you're gonna get really hot temperatures um, potentially in, in the soil. And this has implications um, for recruitment in dry versus wet swamps. Um, perhaps you'll be recruiting different species because they're stimulated differently. Um, also, please do keep in mind that this isn't a wild wildfire simulation. It was a simulation of really a cool hazard reduction burn. On to the next slide. If we look at species richness next, this figure displays some interesting ecological and multiple disturbance effect, effects. Um, we found strong evidence for an ecological time lag in species richness. It was only in the latter stages of the experiment that the hydrological effects became evident across different water availabilities. And I guess I'm asking you to really look at the unburnt side. So the left-hand side of that figure you can see that the low, medium and high track fairly similarly for a while. And it's really only in the latter stages, the last 18 months of the experiment, that the low um, water availability sods really fall away in terms of um, species richness. Um, we also found strong evidence of a synergistic interaction between fire and water treatments. Um, and this is really evident via the medium sods. So those orange lines, you can see that they start to differentiate themselves from the higher sods in the burnt treatment um, much, and they become much more similar to the low sods in the burnt treatment than they do in the unburnt treatment. Um, they continue to track the high sod responses in the unburnt treatment. So um, I'll return to this in a few slides just to sort of, um, cement that. If I move on to the next slide, um, we're still analysing the full species composition information for the experiment, but it does look um, like some of the species, um, but if we look at some of the species that are adapted to the wet swamp conditions, we can see some trends. So 
if we start with Macarena teredifolia, which is um, used to be called Baumia teredifolia, as some of you know that one, um, it occurs in both the cyproid heath and the tea tree thicket vegetation communities. But it seems to be most affected by a combination of hydrological and fire disturbance. And this can be seen by its reduced representation over time in the low water availability burnt sods. And if you click that, Rachel, we should be able to, yeah, there, that's what I'm talking about, that it actually has reduced representation over time in the low water availability burnt sods. Um, so it has this combination of, it responds to a combination of hydrological and fire disturbance in, a, in an adverse manner. If we then look at glycania microphylla, it occurs predominantly in tea tree thicket. It seems to be affected by the hydrological disturbance even in the absence of burning. So if you click that one, that's what I'm talking about. It's mostly affected um, by hydrological disturbance um, alone. So on to the next slide. Are the management implications of, of this research? Well, our, re, our glasshouse results provide evidence of an ecological time lag in biomass and richness responses following hydrological change. In practical terms, this means that a mine swamp may not show measurable change for at least 18 months after the mining disturbance. So decision makers need to be cognizant that it isn't a case of if, but when ecological effects of mining manifest. So you can't walk out into a swamp that's been um, undermined and, and or had a fire through it in the you know, weeks and months afterwards and expect to see the result. Often there is this ecological uh, time lag, which, um, which, which is difficult for decision makers to kind of um, make decisions on the hop, so to speak. Um, we also found evidence of synergistic hydrological and fire effects on species richness and composition. Fire disturbance certainly compounded hydrological disturbance and it drove an acceleration of community change. This has implications for both a post mining and post climate change environment. And finally, we found that even moderate reductions in water availability amplified fire effects in glasshouse sods. So if we consider those medium sods that I was talking about a couple of slides ago, if we consider them to be analogous to partially dewatered swamps, so perhaps on the margin of the mining footprint, swamps on the margin of the mining footprint, we may expect that the compounding hydrological and fire disturbance will actually transform these communities and they may ultimately resemble the worst case scenario of swamps that have been completely dewatered. So on to the next slide. So now to tie in the policy implications of the research. We've provided quantitative evidence of persistent hydrological impacts of long wall mining. And we know that these impacts are largely irreversible because all the documented um, industry attempts at restoration have failed to re-establish the pre-mining hydrological functions. We've also shown that fire disturbance, which is inevitable in these landscapes, compounds hydrological disturbance and it results in these transitions to different vegetation communities. We know that upland swamps are geographically restricted in Australia and this is reflected in their endangered status at both the state and the federal level. So in a policy context, Decision makers need to identify upland swamps at sites where targets are highly irreplaceable. So if you just click that, that's the center bit there. That's really where they need to sit. Our mitigation hierarchy policy framework therefore dictates that upland swamps should be avoided when long wall mines are approved. Avoidance is the only approach to prevent further hydrological and biodiversity impacts. The primary option for impact avoidance is to inform developers of long wall exclusion zones below upland swamps prior to submission of mine proposals so that these landscape elements can be excluded from mining footprints. On to the next slide. We can see with this graphical representation that multiple disturbance can force upland swamps to transition to novel communities. So they may be happily sort of on the left-hand side of this graphic, just rolling around in that, that basin of attraction over there in the natural swamp conditions. But long wall mining forces them sort of down this 
um, precipice as, as we move towards the right hand side, wildfire gives them greater acceleration towards this bottom basin of attraction where they're in this novel community. And it's difficult, if not impossible, for them to return to those natural swamp conditions. On to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to touch on some of the other research that we're doing because the talk was about multiple threats. And we've certainly talked about um, uh, subsidence from long ore mining and, and fire being um, potential threats for upland swamps, but there are other, other threats to them. Um, and we've got a number of research topics that we're pursuing this year. We're looking more broadly at threats of, um, of swamp persistence. And um, one of these is the contemporary occurrence of Phytophthora cinnamomai within and around upland swamp habitat. As you may know, Phytophthora cinnamomai is an introduced soil-borne water mold pathogen, and it's often called root rot as well. Um, it causes severe damage to the native vegetation by infecting the roots or the stem bases of plants. It destroys the host uh, water conducting cells and infected plants display drought-like symptoms and they're often killed by the infection. Many species in the Ericaceae, the Fabaceae, Proteaceae and the Xanthoraceae are especially susceptible to infection and to death. So we're talking Waratah, Banksia, grass tree, heath species, and many more of the characteristic um, swamp species. In the top right-hand side, you can see um, a photo of Phytophthora going, growing out of an infected, um, of infected roots uh, on an agar plate. The occurrence of Phytophthora was mapped by the department in 2015. And a map from that report is shown here. And you can see that the red dots are the um, sites where sampling was positive for Phytophthora cinnamomai and the black dots um, were negative. Seven years ago, approximately 50% of sites returned a positive result. We've since completed another round of soil sampling finished in February, and we're awaiting the laboratory results to determine if the threat has intensified um, for Darawal National Park. It's really worrying that Phytophthora is so widespread in these conservation areas. Prevention to date is really the only effective measure that's, that's been put forward. Chemical treatment is generally limited and it's uh, necessarily localised. So it's things like hygiene protocols, wash down bays for vehicles, limiting new tracks and trails and um, implementing boot cleaning stations or, or boot cleaning amongst um, bushwalkers themselves that will limit the spread of the pathogen into uninfected areas. Um, on to the next slide. And this is one of the sites where pending the lab results, we suspect that there has been infection by Phytophthora cinnamomai. You'll note that it's not an upland swamp, but we, we sampled throughout Darawal National Park, reasoning that uh, if we found infection proximate to the swamps, then that poses a threat to the swamps themselves. Um, and you can certainly see dieback in the shrub layer of this photo. The implications are that the community diversity declines as susceptible species are locally um, excluded. On to the next slide. So I've spoken a bit about the transformative potential of fire in swamp communities, but we're also wanting to investigate the increased risk of peat soil fires in dewatered and climate change affected swamps. And these are fires that are subterranean. Um, they can be very, very difficult to distinguish. Um, the peat of the upland swamps provides a fuel and the fires can smolder for many weeks or even months. These fires can be very destructive because the high soil temperatures for extended peri periods can effectively sterilize the soil seed bank. And this affects the regeneration potential of the swamps. The fires also remove the physical substrate um, and this obviously is a habitat that the swamp plants need um, for growth and persistence. In addition to the multiple disturbance effects that we've monitored in our glasshouse experiment, we'll also be conducting some laboratory studies where we will subject 
variously wetted or dried um, peat soil to combustion and we'll determine how complete that how complete that combustion actually is. In the left, sorry, in the right hand um, top corner, you can see a similar setup to what we're proposing. Um, and this was undertaken by Linda Pryor and colleagues in Tasmania, where they have a similar sort of peat fire problem. Um, and this sort of trial will help us understand soil moisture thresholds and allow us to develop a peat fire response strategy to suppress and reduce impacts of, of substrate fires. On to the next slide. Another threat to swamp conservation um, is climate change. And it's likely that long-term climatic drying will affect swamps by causing contraction of their boundaries and threaten their long-term persistence. The figures here on the right-hand side show results from bioclimatic modeling that David Keith and colleagues undertook in 2000 and um, 14. And we can see that the present day distribution of suitable swamp environment is there in red. I think I've lost some of the graphics down below, but the red is, is, is um, has high suitability and um, the green has low suitability, which is a little bit counterintuitive. But um, the black line is the O'Hare's Creek catchment boundary, which encloses a large chunk of swamps. The blue areas in each of the graphics are below suitability thresholds. And you can see that by 2050, suitability is predicted to be much reduced and shifted to the south. One of our tasks in this coming year is to update the models and examine how swamp distributions are, are tracking. And it's important to recognize that the threats we've been discussing can act in concert. So climate change can increase the frequency of extreme fire weather days and we can see, and we may see much more frequent fire as a result of the drier conditions in swamp habitat. So in conclusion, what's the outlook for upland swamps? Well, we've seen that swamps um, certainly provide important ecosystem services and they have intrinsic and biodiversity value. Um, the threats they face are definitely clear and present. We can mitigate these threats in part um, and a big way of doing that is by avoiding more, more mining under or proximate to swamp communities. And this will address immediate hydrological and fire disturbance threats. Climate change is a particularly intractable um, problem and it requires a global effort, but the swamps themselves are certainly worth it. If we just go to the next slide. I'd like to acknowledge um, the Environmental Trust and SOS in funding the research. And I'll leave we, you with some further pictures which demonstrate just how worth it, just back on that, yeah, on that one, um, the swamps and their surroundings actually are. Um, we've got the beautiful um, waratah in flower there, this amazing blue fungal fruiting body that we happened across recently when we were doing um, some of the, uh, the Phytophthora sampling, and I think it's an Entoloma species. Um, I could stand corrected on that, but I had never come across that before. And of course, a beautiful Stokes Creek and, and all of the um, water that flows in from the swamps into um, some, you know, these tributaries. It's, it's so important in the catchment areas. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tanya. That was amazing. Um, and we've got a bunch of questions rolling through in the chat. So um, we are running pretty close to the hour time. So I, I think we can go through a few of them and see how we go in terms of time um, and when we have to call it. But if you do have questions, you could email Power um, and maybe we could organize passing them on to Tanya as well. Cool, so I'll just start at the top of the chat, um, Kay is asking, is Tanya aware of any Phytophthora hygiene measures being taken by mining companies that operate in the special areas? I'm not. Um, I'm sure there are protocols. I guess I haven't paid particular attention to that. We've been really just revisiting that 2015 study to see whether the threat is intensifying in Darawal. 
So I can't really comment on the protocols. I'd imagine they are, you know, in documentation. I'm not sure how enacted they are. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I might throw to Jody. Um, if you're there, Jody, or anyone else whose questions I'm asking, um, you can also turn on your mic um, and clarify anything as well. Um, but Jody asks, are there any good fires for the swamps or should all fire be excluded? Please describe any good fires. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a good question, but fires are definitely important for the swamps. Um, there are certain areas, for example, in Darrell at Spring to Mind, where the Banksia thicket is um, sort of overdue for fire. It's been, you know, decades since fire. Um, and then there are other areas that, um, you know, I don't, I don't actually know of any in Darrell that have had too frequent fire necessarily, uh, which is a good thing. Um, but no, fire is definitely a part of um, the regeneration requirements for upland swamps. And the different sub-communities require um, different fire intervals and frequencies and intensities and seasons and so on. Um, but no, fire is definitely a part of um, their requirements. All right, we've got one from Emma. Um, I say thank you so much, Tanya, for your presentation. Is NPWS likely to take action on the Phytophthora problem? It is one that other park, parks departments have been active on in the past. Example, WA on Jared dieback. Yeah, and... WA has such a you know immense problem with phytophthora. It's sort of called the environmental bulldozer over there, and you can well see it seems to be less. I yeah, I say this with trepidation, but less of you know a catastrophe on the east coast. I I I can be corrected on that, of course, but um, yeah, in terms of national parks i'm i'm not a national parks person but um certainly our investigation has garnered the support of the local rangers they're very interested in um ensuring that the threat is minimized because they they see it they recognize it i mean it's a bit i when i say it's not as catastrophic i guess it is really quite insidious if i sort of go back to that um, photo that i showed you you could see the shrub layer was really quite affected by what we suspect is phytophthora so it's perhaps insidious you know like you just get this drop out of some species um some selected species but the whole community becomes much more depauperate um so i think parks is definitely interested um and on this problem and the fact that it is um a key threatening process certainly for upland swamps the ecosystem so um, endangered ecological communities, upland swamps are one, and phytophthora is listed as a threatening process for them. So, yeah, it's certainly front of mind. Cool. Um, all right, we've hit eight o'clock, but I might just do a couple, maybe two more questions, and then um, the rest we can compile on a list and send them off. Um, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I'll ask one from Nick and then Rascal is there asking for one <laughs> um, as power. But so Nicholas says, thanks so much, Tanya. Very interesting research and clear relationships shown. Is there a relationship between occurrence of swamps and coal deposits, example, geological factors? Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether there's that clear correlation between coal deposits, because I don't know if it's sort of a conflagration of sort of, you know, thinking peat in the soil layer doesn't necessarily relate to coal deposits below. I think the coal deposits sort of cover a range of vegetation communities. Um, and because swamps occupy this mosaic, so they're in amongst the eucalyptus woodland and so on, I don't think there's a direct correlation between coal deposits and um, overlying swamps, if that answers the question. I think they're sort of much more wide ranging the coal deposits. And what was the other question? Was that it? I think that, I think that was it. 
Okay. <laughs> so, Rascal, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I do. I also um, want to remind everyone um, and also let you know if you don't know that um, the Dendrobium Mines Environmental Impact Statement will come out on the Department of Planning website at some point. We're not sure when. It could be tomorrow. It could be in months. But when it does come out, Power will be calling on all of you to write submissions against the proposal to expand Dendrobium. Um, there's two other things Power is really asking people to get involved in. We've got a whole lot of leaflets and a lot of us spend a lot of time going around our neighbourhoods. Many of you, I'm sure, have done the same. Uh, leafleting your neighbours. A lot of people would have no idea that there's even mining happening in the water catchment, let alone these really rich and detailed um, impressions of what upland swamps mean to our water system. And the third thing that we're asking as well um, is to run stalls um, with power. So if there's community events happening, school events, local markets, get in touch with power and we can set you up to run a stall yourself or we'll, we're happy to come along um, and do that with you. We're meeting every fortnight and it's open to anyone and it's still online. So it's quite accessible for many of you. If you'd like to get involved, just send us a message on the Facebook or over email. But I do have a question and it, and it relates to something that, um, a man wrote on the power page recently and he identified himself and he might be here so sorry if you are well not sorry but if you are you can maybe jump in um he said he worked for water new south wales and he was looking at um he did a lot of the approvals for the mines and his comment was oh it's raining so much the poor swamps are getting all you know nice and wet and it was you know obviously a bit of a cynical um dig and i said oh you should come to this talk with dr tanya mason i think you'd find it really informative and he said, oh, actually, I do the approvals for the mines. And I was like, okay, interesting. And I just wondered what you would say to him. You talked about fire and, and we've been having, obviously, a massive um, flood problem in New South Wales at the moment. What role do you think that, does it matter that it's raining a lot on swamps? Can it rejuvenate them? What would you say to that, that guy? Well, I would point him to some of the um, those hydrological signatures that we were talking about earlier in the discussion where when you have the mine, when you have the swamp being undermined, you get these really rainfall responsive spikes. So basically, rather than being a groundwater dependent system, um, you get a system that's just responding to rainfall. So uh, if you were to just, uh, you know, survey the swamps in that month, two months, three months, however long you've got that really high rainfall, then perhaps you would perceive that, at least in terms of soil moisture, perhaps the, the composition had already changed um, because the mining had occurred X years prior and the changes were already in, in train. But if you were just looking at soil moisture, then potentially you wouldn't see a difference. But the fact that we're in a La Nina, um, that's all well and good but uh, an El Nino is going to follow that. And the undermined swamps will then return to a very dry, um, uh, you know, uh, state. Um, and they won't be able to have that sponge-like um, function anymore. So, yeah, I would, I would dispute that a, a short duration in the you know lifetime of a swamp, short duration of rainfall is really going to solve anything. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks so much, Tanya, for your time and for everyone for waiting that extra five minutes um, over the eight o'clock mark. Um, we'll save all the rest of these questions and um, pass them on. But there's a lot of thanks in there for you, Tanya. So um, we appreciate you coming out tonight and preparing that presentation and given, giving us such a great um, view of the upland swamps that we didn't have before. Thank you, month. it's been great to share the research, so thank you. And don't forget next month we're bringing you Creatures of the Catchment and Tom's on the line, Tom will be speaking about koalas. We've got Dr Ian Wright from Western Sydney University speaking also about the green tree frog. frog. We may have a UOW researcher hopefully talking about gliders. Um, it's going to be an all-star cast of the fabulous creatures that live um, in the water catchment. So please join us. Um, make sure you register for that. It is on May 6th. The 4th of May. 4th of May. So we look yeah, forward yeah. to seeing you all then. Thanks again, yeah. Tanya. Thanks, everyone. Thank